So we we'll move on from our uh, uh, first presentation, please. Talked about the idea is to talk about tools and techniques for treating PAD, especially when it comes to the multi-level disease. Um, the the multi-level disease in CLI patients does actually bring on a, a challenge that requires a shift in mindset from going to SFA large diameter uh, vessel, a more robust wall, to a tibial vessel that is significantly lesser, smaller diameter with somewhat less robust wall. So the, uh, your thought process and the tips and tricks and techniques that you need to use for both is somewhat different. And when you recognize that, you realize the value of uh, ha having in the back of your mind the right tools for the right vessel and the right tips and tricks in terms of techniques for the right vessel as well. We, so we discussed CLI in detail yesterday, and I hope you've gotten the message that uh, we have to treat the common femoral artery, the profunda, the SFA, and the popliteal, and the tibials. But occasionally, um, and, and it was clearly presented, that sometimes these um, beds of vessels just mentioned are intact. And the problem is actually beyond that. It's, be, be, it's below the ankle. And uh, if, you talk, if you think about this about three, four years ago, that is so, somewhat uncomprehensible to go below the ankle and try to address it. But now, not only do we have um, endovascular therapy for that, we have uh, open surgical therapy for that, and uh, today we have additional modes of therapy for it um, that we will share with you around 10 o'clock. This is an example of a patient that um, had an angiogram, diagnostic angiogram done, and uh, from a catheter initially placed in the aeroiliac junction. And I gotta tell you, for a long time, that was okay, because we had some good data when we did it. But the runoff, as you can see here, uh, shows a brisk, decent flow all the way down to the tibial vessels. And you, it's fair to say there's nothing going on here, and most likely, this is not ischemic. Then we learned about the uh, phenomena of selective angiography and subselective angiography, as Dr. Diaz, my partner, calls it, where you would take a catheter down to individual tibial vessels and look for the tibial pedal junction and the pedal loop reconstruction. And this is an example of a patient who have an ulcer, Rutherford 5, uh, the final diagnosis for the patient was this is a diabetic ulcer and no ischemic revascularization will help you. What's interesting in this uh, final runoff here is you do see uh, quickly that catches your eye the posterior tibial artery at the ankle strap to have some form of disease and you can sort of say this is okay, about 50%, that's not important to fix, probably that is not the problem. And the AT, you know, somewhat kind of uh, disappears around the mid dorsalis superior artery. And the question here, you know, how far do you go to treat this? Or maybe further diagnosis might be warranted to look at the brisk uh, posterior and anterior uh, circulation connection, which might tell us some more information. And this angiogram is being performed via integrate selective angiography. So given that this patient has not healed despite a prolonged uh, wound care healing and therapy, which I do respect uh, those that do it, I think they do a phenomenal job and they do have a high uh, healing rate in their institutions, but occasionally you get a case like this where things just don't heal. So here is the angiogram and uh, probably by looking at it you can tell that this patient's uh, ulcers are extensive and they do extend to the, um, uh, the, the great, first great toe and the lateral aspect of the foot consistent with both the medial plantar and lateral plantar artery and also the distribution of the AT. So the question here would be, um, do, we, do we really uh, just stop here and continue hyperbaric therapy and probably some more aggressive wound care or do we try to measure the, the value or hemodynamic measurements to see how serious is this? So um, 
so, Dr. Davis, uh, if you were to look at this and try to really assess, is this really causing the ulcer, or is it just the aberic neuropathy? Is there any other means that you would do to try to assess this? Well, I think the tissue perfusion uh, studies is probably the best way to do it at this point, you know, with, with O2 uh, perfusion and see what you have down there. Um, and I think if it's, uh, if, if you've got good tissue perfusion based on your non-invasive studies, uh, I think I'd just continue uh, treating it. Uh, I think you also have to look at the whole picture as to how well they've been doing, whether it's uh, offloading the foot, how compliant they've been with their, with their uh, wound care and things to that degree. So I think you have to look at the, the whole picture in that degree yeah. and work with, work with who's ever doing the wound care to see exactly how they're doing with that. So, but, it, you know, obviously the stuff that we see is usual total occlusions and, and uh, where it's a very obvious so case, this is not obviously. That's good, that, you know, at least we, start, we have to look at different measures, it's great. Dr. Conte, something like this, how would you approach it in your practice? Well, the best test for perfusion is the debridement itself. So if you're doing the wound care yourself and you do the debridement and there's bleeding, it usually is a pretty good sign that there's adequate perfusion. You didn't show us a picture of the foot, but what the foot looks like is probably more important than the angiogram. A lot of patients like this uh, should be able to heal even a simple partial digital amputation. So it depends on the debridement. And that's, a, that's a very good point, actually. Uh, so during the debridement, if there's bleeding, um, then some, well, most of it should be healing. That's a good point. The, so if you do a TBI um, on a patient like this, um, uh, Dr. Lee, what do you think the TBI would be considering this lateral view and the type of flow that you see here? I mean, I think the flow looks pretty good. Um, it's hard to say, you know, with the calcium, you know, although they say it's not supposed to be calcified. We see plenty of calcification down there, so uh, sometimes it's not completely reliable. But in this case, the, the flow looks pretty good. Uh, so I agree completely with the, the, the two panelists that, you know, what the wound looks like uh, clinically and also hemodynamic criteria. So you notice how many seconds uh, it's taken for the blood to get from here to the toe. And mind you, this is an 035 catheter place in the posterior tibialatary. So uh, normally, in, in normal vessels, when you put an O35 catheter in the posterior tibialotary or a selective tibialotary and do a brisk injection, you normally would see a brisk flow to the distal distribution of the artery and then retrograde filling into the um, opposite uh, circulation. We don't see that. And the TBI was in the 0.3 range. Do you have any other non-invasive studies here? Do you have tissue perfusion? We, we didn't do SPP on this one, but uh, we just did the uh, TBI and followed the ankle pressure and the TBI, and both were somewhat. The ankle pressure actually was not as bad as we thought, but TBI was. And made us, that made us think the problem probably was in the junction between the PT and the plantar arteries. This is just to show you the amount of calcification present in uh, the, this posterior tibial artery, and the ankle strap area, we learned from our uh, vascular surgery colleagues that this is a very hostile environment for the posterior tibial artery and less to, to the AT, but still hostile environment for both. So uh, when we treat this segment, we always treat it with the most cautiousness possible because you cannot afford to cause any problems in this uh, segment here. So Fadi, if you were to treat and you have to treat this, um, and you, you're familiar with this case with the IVIS and uh, really high-grade stenosis in the 90%, severely 360 degrees, severely calcified, how would you treat it today? Well, you know, uh, Jihad, I'm looking, I'm looking at the pictures. I mean, this, this patient is in trouble. Uh, whenever you see intact tibial flow and uh, uh, sluggish plantar flow, these patients are in trouble. And, you and I have those patients in our practice that, you know, we, we, struggle, we struggle with them. Luckily, uh, they're the minority of patients in CLI patients. And to your point, in terms, of, in terms of this area, this is a very challenging area. You cannot put a stent. If you put a stent, you doom the vessel. Uh, balloon angioplasty does not work, especially with the amount of calcification. Um, so so you, need, you need something to really modify the vessel or prepare the vessel to at least receive 
um, low pressure balloon angioplasty because you, there's no wiggle room in this area. Yeah. Lawrence, um, seeing this uh, angiogram here, and um, atherectomy was discussed at length yesterday, and the value of debulking before doing balloon angioplasty, and we're embarking on recorded technology in the future, but in the meantime, if you were to use an atherectomy device, and please don't say CSI because this is sponsored by CSI, we appreciate you guys. But this is a, let it be a complete uh, educational session. What's your first of choice atherectomy device, or do you think atherectomy device should be used here? Well, I think that despite the, uh, the ownership of the, uh, of the session, I think that you have to look at, at what gets down there and gets there safely and easily. So I think of all the atherectomy devices, you know, directional, um, there's a very small cutter, an ES cutter, um, probably doesn't do as well for um, longer lesions, but for short lesions like this, you could probably deliver and, and chip away and at least, come, you know, get the 90% lesion that you want to treat out. The uh, rotational devices, there's a tibial device from Pathway, which is probably a little too bulky to get down to this level. I think uh, Sonia showed some pretty good data um, with uh, the standard rotational atherectomy from uh, Boston Scientific. Very uh, deliverable system for coronary, so it should be deliverable here and probably can modify this plaque. Uh, likewise, our sponsor, CSI, uh, is a very fluid system that allows the uh, delivery of a, of a rotational device and can actually modify it. Yeah. Uh, and then you have Athromed. You know, Tom's uh, 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 ease uh, data really does show that it's a, a very useful device to get down there. Our first line therapy for this would probably be more a rotational device, uh, whether it be Rota or CSI, because Great. I think it can deliver relatively easily. Well, thank you. And, and this is a final test that I just want to show the audience here. This is an O3-5 catheter and doing a direct inject, injection into the uh, PT and the plantar arteries and notice the sluggish flow. Uh, this is a very ominous sign when you see that in uh, advanced disease and pretty much uh, we know that this needs to be treated. So why don't we actually stop here for a second and we'll get back to this case after the life case is, uh, is done. And we, we are able actually to go ahead and switch to Dr. Adams' um, case.